welcome everyone to uh, our study of Chigam Trungpa's The Future is Open, which is a presentation on the topic of karma. The subtitle is Good Karma, Bad Karma, and Beyond Karma. Now, um, in presenting this material, presenting this book, as always, I'd like to make a disclaimer. This is not a digest of the book. Um, you could even question whether it's a accurate representation of the book itself, of the author's intention. I'm sharing with you my uh, thoughts in regard to, as I've been reading this. And so um, I would very much really uh, emphasize the value of reading the book itself. What I'm going to be doing is uh, looking at some of the points that I think are important in this discussion. And so um, I'm putting these on the PowerPoint that you're seeing on your screen. Um, and of course, where I'm coming from is very much a place of uh, deep respect and the wish to celebrate this particular book. I consider this a very important book. Um, we've touched on the issue of karma in the past in Charlie Rinpoche's uh, work. And uh, this is, karma is definitely something that's essential in terms of not just understanding Buddhism, but in terms of understanding our situation. Uh-oh. Can somebody just confirm that they actually can hear me, that the audio is working? Can you hear me? Audio, okay, thank you. Oh, that's good. Good, good, good. Excellent. All right. So, so, um, so like I say, this is more a reflection of my own appreciation for this work. And also, of course, um, coming from a place of thinking this is, or viewing the topic of karma as very, very important. Like I say, not just in terms of studying Buddhism, but in terms of understanding our conditions. So, um, First of all, just a word on the author, Chögyam Trungpa Rinpoche. So um, it's impossible really to sum up um, the life of somebody who's, who's, um, whose activity and impact was as vast as Trungpa Rinpoche's was, but we can roughly sort of touch on some of the key moments in his life has recognized as the 11th Trungpa Tuku, uh, recognized by the Kamapa and the 10th Trungpa's close students, um, enthroned as abbot of Sumang Monastery in Eastern Tibet. And if you read his life story, uh, born in Tibet, and also recently a really excellent exposition about his, his um, escape from Tibet, which was quite extraordinary, then we, we see a life of someone who was a great teacher, he was what we call a tatan, a treasure revealer in the tradition of Padmasambhava. He was an artist, poet, author. And um, already before leaving Tibet, he had already a prolific uh, authorship behind him. Um, then, of course, there was Trumpurimj's escape from Tibet. Like I said, this was documented recently in a book called uh, From the Lion's Jaw. And then in India, Trumpurimj, uh, after a nine month, uh, escaped from Tibet, arrived in India. Working with Frida Bidi, he was, he was chosen to be principal of something called Young Lama's Home School in um, Dalhousie or Missouri. And then he was given a, um, I think, a Spalding grant to study at Oxford, where he um, immersed himself in Western culture, did comparative religion, psychology, and so on. And then also together with Akong Rinpoche, he founded a Buddhist contemplative center up in Scotland called Samuel Ling, which was the first Tibetan Buddhist center really of its kind in the UK. Then traveling to the US in 1970, he famously was the founder of the Vajradhatu and the Shambhala um, organizations where his teaching um, could, could be uh, communicated. He founded Naropa Institute, a secular university. He founded Gampo Abbey for monastics. And um, 
he was prolific in terms of, as an artist, in terms of theater, movie making, poetry, painting, photography, calligraphy, ikebana, dressage, and so forth. And also, as many of us know, he left a tremendous amount of writing, or rather his talks have been edited and published in, um, in a lot of different contexts. So I think everybody is familiar with that. So um, we are very fortunate that we have the legacy of Trungpa Rinpoche and also for us who approach the whole study of spirituality, Buddhism and so on, there's probably no one who to the same degree really, certainly from Asian quarters, is able to communicate the vision and the practice of, of uh, particularly Buddhism then in terms of the modern idiom, in terms of uh, being familiar with our language and also our concepts, our psychology, and so forth. Um, so that's briefly on uh, Trungpa Rinpoche. And then um, in this work, we have the preface by Carolyn Rose Gimeon. And um, together with Judith Leaf and people like um, Sherab Chitsin and so on, we have Trungpa Rinpoche's work presented uh, in edited form in a modern context, which is uh, really amazing. Carolyn Rose Gimian has done some amazing work. And again, I'd like to right away dis make a disclaimer. I'm not really making a summary of her preface here, but just some thoughts that arise as I've been reading through it. And um, this is that what she what she's talking about in the preface is that what we're going to be doing here is challenging some very popular but very often flawed ways that the term karma is interpreted both in terms of classical works and also in terms of our colloquial way of representing the notion of karma. So basically we could say karma is about working with our given life situation. And this is about working with our conditions, our very real relative experience of our reality, being proactive and ultimately of course, going beyond karma itself. Now the thing about and this we will be looking at um, from various angles. When we're speaking about karma, um, we're talking about something that is not particularly Buddhist, just like when we're talking about gravity, we're not really talking about some sort of scientific belief. Science documents and maps the phenomena such as, as gravity. And within Buddhism, we operate with the notion of how we construct our reality, how we work with um basically creating conditions for ourselves sometimes we are victims of conditions sometimes we are proactive but in doing so very often in the western context there's some problematic ideas that seem to come with the notion of trying to understand our reality and that's basically two extreme views one is the view that there's somebody some sort of divine creator that has created everything. Basically, what we find very often in religions, the sort of the notion that somebody else out there is doing it, somebody out there is in charge. And, um, and then there's also a modern, um, you could say, reaction to that, which is to say, that's rubbish. There's nobody who is creating anything for us. Uh, the universe basically works without any kind of direction or purpose. It's just random. And both of these are situated within very cerebral philosophical speculations, because what we in fact can observe in our reality is that what we do has an impact. So if we are pursuing negative aggressive actions, we very often have a rather depressed outlook. If we are being generous, grateful and so forth, we very often have a corresponding uplifted and upbeat outlook. And in general, also our sort of interaction with our world around us is has so much to do with what we do with ourselves. If we're generous to people, we have kindness. If we are aggressive with people, we meet corresponding aggression. So it's not really as if this working with cause and effect is that mysterious. So that is what karma very much is about. Ultimately, of course, what we're going to look at, and which is the Buddhist project, if you like, is the whole idea of freeing ourselves from the cycle of action, reaction, and the, the, the um, limitations 
that we very often impose on ourselves in terms of our habitual ways of engaging with the world. So in that sense, karma can also be understood as something that's limiting. And ultimately, we would say enlightenment is going beyond the notion of karma itself. But, and what is particular about this work that we're looking at here, it's not about doctrinal definitions. We're not going to be looking at uh, the etymology particularly, or historical representations of karma. We're more about um, intending this to be something that's a practical guide. And of course, we are intending this to be for practitioners of uh, meditation and the integration of meditation. And VCTR is then meaning um, the venerable Chögyam Trungpa Rinpoche. He was well aware of the Western projections onto the issue of karma. He was very aware of Western projections in general in encountering um, spirituality and particularly Buddhism. And when he was teaching karma, he would draw on immediate psychological experience in the audience rather than the foreign ideas about you know, karma in terms of past lives, future lives, which for the, for the modern person is quite speculative and doesn't really relate to something that can be seen as um, immediate experience and what we generally assert as um, valid and uh, valid understanding of our experience. Famously within Buddhist cultures, you do talk about past and future lives, but you do so within a science that's established within its own particular empiricism, its own particular parameters that draw on integration of an understanding of the role of the mind. In our scientific, modern scientific context, we generally draw on an empiricism that's related to the material, the observable, the quantifiable. And that kind of objectivist science doesn't really take into account the whole dimension of what it means to be, to be clear psychologically or not. Of course, we know from quantum physics, and in our own experience, that our psychology and our subjective way of relating to our world shapes the world. But it's not really something that's part of the scientific outlook. And so we also have a correspondingly materialist outlook in terms of our reality. And some of the Buddhist notions of what we call the various realms of samsara doesn't really fit in with our uh, materialist outlook. So when Trungpa Rinpoche was speaking about the, the six realms, was speaking about the hell realms or the heaven realms and so on, this was very much interpreted in terms of a Christian outlook and the sort of a, the view of this being the very deterministic or in terms of being possibly punishment and so forth. And so it sparked a lot of reaction. So Trungpa Rinpoche, when he presents karma, he generally addresses something that's familiar to the audience in terms of psychological experience. And of course, this is something that we also find in classical presentations of karma and in Buddhist presentation of karma that we, we operate with the very core of it as originating within our own psychological attitudes. And Tungpa Rinpoche balances what we call relative and absolute truth, which is um, taking responsibility for our own action and also um, ultimately how we go beyond the, uh, the limitations of karma. Um, Trungpa Rinpoche in part two then of the work, he teaches how we construct samsara and also he speaks about this throughout and he then addresses the issue of the 12 nidanas, the 12 links of dependent origination. But what he particularly returns to all the time is a very immediate um, presentation of how our mind works, how it operates, and the empowerment, the agency that lies within this awareness of our own mind and how to work with it. And that's where he emphasizes the practice of sitting meditation, how we, um, through the practice of sitting and through the practice of meditation, we're able to beginning to find some freedom from the ordinary uh, habitual patterns that we have. And this is where we speak about finding gaps or finding space. So I've put up in the um, archives or in the, um, the Dropbox, I have 
um, a section that's that has reading material and uh, I put in I've um, I've uploaded something on the development of ego which is um, from cutting through spiritual materialism and we'll see this has a lot to do with what we're going to be looking at in terms of karma and also I've um, I've uploaded a piece on um, an academic piece that I'm very keen on from Matthew Ricard and um, Michael Dambois, which is about what it means to basically work from the point of view of self-centering, catering to our self-centering, and practicing egolessness. What these two, you could say, opposed practices does in terms of our happiness, in terms of identifying what brings about in enduring happiness, and what is it that brings about short-lived happiness. And then finally also I put up a piece from uh, Longchenpa, which is again about how samsara originates. So the, this you can find in the section on reading material in the Dropbox. So part one of the work is called The Birth of Karma. And chapter one is called Karma, Compassion and the Dark Age. So karma is the energy through which we function, is the cause and effect present in every situation. We need to understand karma independent of dogmas and metaphysics. Karma means action. It applies both in samsara and nirvana. And quite simply, what we mean with it is it is energy. So again, um, it's quite important that we understand that karma is not about some sort of um, some sort of Buddhist thing. It's the Buddhist word for something that we all experience. So it's something very immediate. And it is, yes, it's the energy that basically carries us from moment to moment. It's the place or the, you could say, the thread that directs our experience. And it's not something that's random. It is based on cause and effect. So there's no need for us to begin to think of karma in terms of Buddhist beliefs, in terms of scriptures or cultural practices, dogma and so forth, or metaphysics, um, sort of abstract higher uh, belief systems. Uh, it's very immediate. It simply just means action. And there's an important point here, which is that when we talk about karma, we understand this as energy, both in terms of the confused experience of our existence and also in terms of enlightened uh, energy. So we're going to be looking at that, but um, important that we understand that karma is something that permeates both samsara and nirvana. In the Mahayana Buddhist vision, what we call samsara is really just reality not properly seen. It's like wearing specks or um, sunglasses, sunnies, where we simply just have a dimmed vision. And taking these off, we see clearer. So any phenomena that we have in samsara has its, you could say, its nirvanic counterpart. In fact, we don't really see samsara as existing anywhere except just in our confused projection. And hence also we would say you will not find nirvana anywhere else than in samsara. So some of the Buddhist traditions, they have a different view. They would say, you're in samsara now. It's a one-shot deal. You can work your way back, but you are basically um, in a place that you need to extract yourselves from. As far as the Mahayana Buddhists say, we're really just, just about taking off some obscuration. So we don't really see samsara as this kind of one-shot deal that we're stuck within. It's very workable. Pongramacha then says, when we talk about the karmic situation, we're speaking about the sense of individual relationship to the given situation, whatever it is. Any given situation is bounded by cause and effect, dependent on some cause and effect. The Sanskrit word karma means creation or action. Basically, that is what karma means, just action. Basically, it refers to action. Buddha activity or the enlightened energy is referred to as karma. The samsaric confused pattern, the chain reaction of confusion is also referred to as karma. So altogether, when we discuss karma, we are discussing energy. 
So this will see here that we are, um, we're going to be looking at karma both in terms of enlightened action and also in terms of the action that we've sort of gotten ourselves caught up in. By the way, as we're going through this presentation, if at any given moment you have questions, please just type them in. You have the, the box for questions and you can just type in your questions there. I usually, I usually start whenever there's a question or if there's a sort of a moment, then I try to address them, the questions. Try to answer them. So first we need to know the relative immediate nature of karma. So I'm just going to read through the, the bullets and then comment a bit and then read Trumper images. So what we have usually here in the bottom is a, a, um, <clears throat> an extract from the, from the book itself. First, we need to know the relative immediate nature of karma. Karma in the samsaric sense is the nature of the duality between this and that. This duality is created by confusion. It is ultimately non-existent yet appears. The experience of it is described in terms of the 12 nidanas, or what we call the 12 links of dependent origination. This process itself originates in bewilderment. Bewilderment takes on patterns, which is karma, good and bad karma. The functioning of bewilderment and its impulses is then mapped in what we call the Abhidharma. So when we talk, so we're going to talk over the next two slides, just we're going to talk about the relative kind of karma, what we experience in our immediate reality. And then we're going to look at going beyond karma. So when we talk about karma in the samsaric sense, which is what drives our experience, this originates in the bewilderment where we had a sense of I, this here, and then we have the other that. So once we have that, this is what we call duality. And this duality is an artificial construct. It's created by confusion. It's ultimately non-existent, and yet we experience it. So when we talk about how our experience then develops, we talk about something called the 12 nidanas, or the 12 links of dependent origination. If you look at the, uh, the wheel of um, existence, you can see on the outer ring, we have these 12 different uh, sections which refer to how bewilderment drives our experience and ultimately leads to our birth, our old age and death, and then again recommences. But the, the point really is that this is all non-existent experience that originates just in a delusion and bewilderment. Now, the thing about this is that on the basis of this sense of I and my particular um, individual um, experience, then we have then the patterns of karma. And then we have good karma, which are pleasant experiences, bad karma, which are negative experiences. And also we could say that's in terms of result, but also in terms of cause, good actions drive happiness, bad actions or negative actions drive um, unhappy experience. All of that and the way that we work with these various kinds of um, bewilderment and also our various kinds of um, impulses, this is all something that we map in the Abhidharma. Just these days um, in Siddhartha's intent on the webinars, on Mondays I'm going through a study of the Abhidharma, but the Abhidharma is about all these various um, psychological um, conditions and how they work. But particularly then, what is of interest for, to us is then what we'll look at, the, the, um, the knowledge of um, the various skandhas, the various ways that our individual experience um, is constructed. Kung Pramaja says, in some sense, it is quite a natural process in which you have a sense of this and here he's talking about bewilderment. You have a sense of this as the instigator of the whole thing, as the basic ground that is felt. Then the natural, almost automatic reaction is that this situation is secured, attacked, or entertained by that. So here we are, I, 
I am secure, insecure, I'm attacked or entertained in relation to the other. So the basic quality of projection or of indulgence in one's projections could be said to be the basic karmic situation. So whether or not this sense of I is, uh, or rather the way that we relate to the other, there is an I that relates to the object, the other, and then begins to pursue that either in terms of indulging in our projections or not, um, that creates then the particular karmic situation, the various experiences, basically on the basis of our, what we call acceptance or rejection or um, trying to reject things or hold on to them. So we have three kinds of impulses. We have positive, negative, and neutral. Now these are created by duality, and they all create karma. While all three, positive, negative, and neutral, are equally held by bewilderment, good karma makes sense. Karma is about our own psychology. It's not an external force or law. The sparks of impulse that drive our karma are preceded by gaps. These gaps are not held by karmic patterning. They are the option of freedom. Okay. Now, what we can observe in terms of our experience is that we, in relation to objects, yeah, we have things we like, we have what we don't like, and then we're neutral. But once we begin to engage in reactive patterns, then we begin to lay down seeds that we repeat these patterns. Now, all of this takes place within the basic confusion, but within this basic confusion, it certainly makes a, it's a lot better to pursue what we can call good karma, the patterns that are not that held by our self-centering and our confusion, and generally the degree to which we can extend beyond our self-centering, our selfishness. To that extent, we have what is called good karma. We could refer to it as ethics, but it's basically just us acting in relation to our perceptions. And that's where this kind of um, less self-centered practice, ethical action or good karma, is creates more freedom. So all the time, remember, we're not talking about some sort of you're being a good boy or a good girl. We're talking about handling ourselves, our own psychology. Now, when we have these, this basic experience of I, then we have the patterns that are about relating to our perceptions. Then we have impulses. Yeah, we, we, we go after things or we reject things and so on. But what is interesting is that these moments of acting, of action, they're preceded by gaps. They're individual moments. And that means that the degree to which we're aware of these gaps and not um, held by our karmic patterning, then there's an option of freedom. To have this freedom is to have some wisdom. And that is, of course, what we are cultivating through the path of liberation, that we begin to be more aware of how we do not necessarily need to be driven by these patternings. And we begin to become aware that every moment of action is actually preceded by some sort of gap. And that's where we begin to discover some sense of free will or freedom. We will be looking at the whole idea of free will and so forth, but of course, what we are saying here is that, yes, on the path to liberation, we increasingly have freedom. Without that kind of insight that the path gives us, we, are, we lack that freedom. Kumbhra says, as long as the dualistic fixation is involved, the karmic situation is automatically involved. Meaning as long as we're stuck in this dualistic fixation, as long as we're stuck in ignorance and ego, we are subject to karma. Trying to develop goodness and trying to fight against badness, in one sense, is the sensible thing to do. This is universally known throughout the world. Yeah? Um, the action of good karma is obviously helpful and helps us to maintain ourselves. The actions of bad karma are not 
or the action of bad karma is not particularly helpful. It leads to further destruction and further neurosis. So the thing about when we act according to good karma, we have it better, but we are not free. So we could Sometimes we would say through good karma, we could be stuck in what we call a golden cage. We're, we're caged, we're happy, but we're, we're actually not free. Paul Rinpoche, he would compare this to being stuck inside a jar, a bee stuck inside a jar, being in the upper part of the jar. The thing about bad karma is that it actually shows us the pain of, of uh, our bewilderment. And that's where you could say, our, our being is reacting to our neurotic action in a healthy way by simply undergoing pain. The problem about bad karma is that we're not free once we're held in bad karma. It leads to very negative places and where we're not really able to work constructively. So this, of course, is, this is, this is an important point. We can say, oh yeah, good karma, bad karma, it's all just, you know, Karma, but there's a big difference between whether we are in a situation of good karma or whether we're in a situation of bad karma. Um, okay, someone is asking, our existence is based on our bewilderment and is an illusion, but they are very real to us. How, we do, how do we deal with that? Well, that is what we're looking at here. Relatively, we are stuck within this delusion and how do we deal with it? Well, we relatively work with creating good karma and ultimately, which is the object, object of the path of liberation, we try to go beyond karma altogether. We try to free ourselves from bewilderment. So temporarily, while we are bewildered, we create conditions for, of good karma and ultimately we go beyond bewilderment, which is the project of enlightenment. Then there's another question. So as often as we, as we can, do we use the mindfulness and try to remember to notice the gaps? Is the gap where our freedom is? Yes, that's exactly it. When we're practicing meditation, it is that we begin to familiarize ourselves with these gaps. And that spills into our post-meditation where obviously we don't necessarily have the freedom or the you could say the luxury that we have when we're sitting in terms of being mindful, but that quality of beginning to recognize the gaps and beginning to recognize how the moments are, uh, you could say, not as continuous as we normally think they are, that's where meditation helps us in our ordinary life. And that's where then we have a practical way of discovering our freedom. You know, sometimes we might hear philosophers say, you know, just freedom in the now or freedom, freedom from thoughts and so on. But without actually having a clear understanding what that means and without actually having a clear method, it's very difficult to do this. And that's where the, it's very helpful that we gain some theoretical understanding through an understanding what karma is and also have a practical method through the practice of meditation. So I hope the sound is okay. As always, if for some reason, then that you're not hearing it, because sometimes it's, it can happen from the broadcaster, but sometimes very often it also happens from the recipient end. So I can't do much about that, but we do have a audio recording that's happening right now. So you can always go back to the audio recording. Second, so we've looked at relative karma within the, the, the context of bewilderment. And then second, we need to know the absolute reality of karma. So confusion requires further confusion to continue. Karma is not like a continuous pipe. It's more like a string of individual beads. In between these individual karmic moments, there are gaps. These gaps provide something beyond confusion. So, Bewilderment is a condition that presently we're stuck, but we also 
recognize that we could free ourselves from bewilderment. We are ultimately not bewildered. And so in terms of absolute reality, in terms of what karma is, then we could free ourselves from that. We want to understand that this whole condition of karma is one moment of confusion that actually requires further confusion to continue. If we inter intercept clarity, if we begin to meditate, then we're beginning to discontinue this confusion. So we don't have like one long stream of confusion. It's more like we have a string of individual beats like you have in a mala. You, you can see that appears like a continuity, but then again, it's individual moments. And that's what we're continually operating with in the practice of meditation on the path that we're beginning to gain some, you could say, uh, autonomy in terms of choosing whether to go with the habitual pattern or whether to be free of that. In between these individual karmic moments, there are gaps. And that's where there are these gaps, they are beyond confusion. Kumbhra says, because each moment has its own existence, each has to maintain itself. Therefore, one situation is looking for the next situation. There are automatically gaps there in which something other than confusion is functioning. So this is something that we can discover in terms of our practice. But it's very important that we have a look at our experience of, let's say, a particular impulse that, for example, we might have impulse to buy chocolate, or we might have an impulse to be angry in particular situations. And we could actually, before we engage the action, of buying a chocolate or reacting, we could actually see ourselves taking a course of action on the basis of just having a little bit of a gap, a little bit of a, an appreciation of the space. Then there's a question, what are the gaps made of? Moments of openness where we can discern our intention? Yeah, that's a very good, that's a very good uh, definition really of these gaps. They're not made of anything. They're actually unmade. But what we're doing is continuing constructing. And what we're actually look, doing is looking up rather than looking down at what we normally see in terms of our, just our psychological material. We're actually looking beyond that. And so it is, yes, moments of openness where we can appreciate or discern our intention. Very good, very good definition. Gap is like the open dimension of a canvas prior to being filled with an image. Anything can happen, but there is always the gap to take a new direction. This gap is the opportunity for the inspiration of freedom through discipline. There is no predestination, nothing determined, no fate. Kumbhara just speaks about the momentum of each psychological impulse is independent. So there is no solidity. We are ultimately free to practice and develop. Now, the operative word in this last line is ultimately, because right now, within our condition of bewilderment, within our conditioning of being so-and-so, Yako, for example, there's a particular inclination to follow particular patterns. What is being waved at us here, or sort of offered us, you could say the possibility, is that we needn't gullibly, torturously, submissively follow these kind of psychological impulses. There's some independence that we could take. And that's why we talk about this open canvas. We are free really to, to um, take a new direction. Uh, Trungpa Rinpoche, he, I think, is it here where he, anyway, yeah. He, um, yeah. Good. So, but there's one important point here, and that is that we could, we could begin to um, engage what we call discipline. 
This is where we begin to talk about the path of enlightenment, because of course, what we're talking about here is the general, what we could call phenomenology or the general experience, just what we observe. But we could be proactive, and that's where we engage in the path. And that's the discipline then where we begin to have a grip on what actually, uh, how actually to handle ourselves. And that's where it's not just that we are philosophers that say, oh yeah, this happens. But it's that we begin to say, yes, this happens, but we can do something about it. And that's where we, we, it's very helpful that we're not predestined to be in one particular way or another. Pumparamita says, karma can only exist in the present moment. It could bounce back through memory from the past, which does affect the present, but karma does not extend beyond the present situation. Therefore, there are possibilities of practicing, disciplining ourselves and developing ourselves. So yes, we would say we have patterns, but you know, these patterns, they're experienced in this very moment. Memories are experienced in this very moment. We might think, oh, this happened in the past. Yeah, but the way that we're constructing that past is taking place in the present moment. The act of constructing the memory is taking place right now. Our view on the past has so much to do with what we're, how we are right now. So all the time we need to recognize that we have this, this possibility of independence and this is where we have the possibility of uh, extracting ourselves. We have a practice of, um, we have the possibility of practice, we have the practice possibility of discipline, we have the practice of extracting or developing ourselves. If everything was predetermined, there would be no point in the path. If we were just in one way, you know, if we were in one particular way, that'd be pointless. If something was unwashable, no point in trying to wash it. So the Buddhist concept of karma challenges this kind of simplification where we just say, oh yeah, this is how I am, can't do anything about it. Good karma makes sense, yet it is not the action of awakening. So yes, as far as our experience goes, we are not in one predetermined way or another. We could create the conditions for a greater, lighter experience, for more happiness, for more freedom, for more choice. So we could have what we call higher rebirth, having an experience of greater karma, yet that's not necessarily going beyond karma altogether. It's just being in a greater, more pleasant place, but it's still within the sense of I and my good situation. As far as the path of awakening goes, then we talk about two kinds of actions that are very helpful, which are what we then, in terms of karma that is directed towards the liberation, we use the term merit, or in Sanskrit, punya, in Tibetan, sunam. And that's where we have two kinds. One is a relative kind, which is more about our circumstances, our relative circumstances, which is the physical merit, the conditions for relative conducing circumstances in terms of liberation. And then wisdom merit, that's genuine insight, uh, insight beyond conditioning altogether. So some, many of you are familiar with these two kinds of, um, we sometimes talk about the two accumulations and then we call it merit and wisdom. It can be understood and we can use different words for it, but one is the, the relative within our given relative circumstances and the other is basically the uh, the conditions that enable us to be free altogether. Now, in Tibetan Buddhism, there's a there's a, a traditional line that identifies how we should understand karma on a relative level, just relative level. Yeah, that's where we would say if you want to know what you did in your past, look at your present situation. If you want to know your future situation, look at, look at what you're doing in the present. So we could speculate about what we were in the past or what we did. That's really what matters. But if we want to know about it, we just need to look at where we are right now. 
everything else will be pretty speculative. But if we look at where we are right now, we can have some idea of some of the conditions that went into constructing where we are. If we want to know where we're going to be in the future, again, that's not up to some external creator or just random chance. It's about what we're doing in the present. Tom says, from this point of view, karma is like a game of chess. Whatever you are on, where, wherever you are on the board at this moment is the result of your past actions. But where, where, whatever you're going to do in the next moment depends on the present situation. The present situation is partly influenced by the past, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But at the same time, the present is also influenced by the future, which is open space and freedom. So, also, by the way, this traditional quote is not in the book, but I just think it's very helpful to understand what Chung Burmese is talking about. And Chung Burmese also, he gives here the example of if we're at a concert, well, we got ourselves there on the basis of choice. Now, we might not like the music, so we're actually free to go. So similarly also um, with the game of chess, so we're not really talking about something that's particularly abstract. It's more about choices that we make or can make. Now, with meditation, there is the opportunity which is based on merit, meaning we have the opportunity now to be free. Now that's based on us actually having gotten into a place where we even consider meditation. So that is something that we would call merit. It's good karma that also enables us to basically be positioned so we could be free altogether. Now, when we, so that's, that's where we got ourselves into, right? That's based on the past, it's based on merit. Now, continuing sitting, that's our choice, right? So we're not controlled. We could very well say, well, this is no fun. I'm gonna get up and go. So we're not controlled. Whereas if we had discipline, that's simplifying our choices. And that's where we begin on the basis of discipline to actually create further merit. And that's where we are not feeding ego further. We have some sanity, some discovery of freedom and that we are pursuing. Even though it's going into a wider place, it's not sort of going in onto itself as ego generally does. It's not indulging ego's pattern, it's something greater. And that's where then we refer to it as discipline. So on the basis of discipline, we say we create karmic reinforcement. We are creating the merit or we're creating the, um, the patterns, the constructive patterns, which is what discipline is. This, this is, combats the ordinary agenda of spiritual materialism because we could very well be pursuing spirituality or virtue just on the basis of we feel safer. We're virtuous, we're good boys and girls in terms of just playing it safe. Whereas discipline is more than just playing it safe. It has, it comes from, particularly of course in Buddhist context, it comes with this vision that is about going beyond our comfort zone. Something like meditation is not particularly about our comfort zone. It opens up. We're not particularly feeding the habitual patterns. We're beginning to be uh, sensitive to the possibility of the gaps, the openness. So the experience of the gap defies the confusing quest for false security. So that is where then this quality of the discipline of meditation is something that actually um, takes us into something greater. And it also leads us beyond this ordinary self-destructive pursuit of security, which ultimately is destructive. Trump just says, we would like to maintain ourselves luxuriously in a situation of spiritual wealth. We're trying to associate our ego with good karma. If the basic ego becomes healthier and more secure, the ultimate achievement is attaining egohood. To transcend that, we have to uproot any kind of false security. The karmic force seems to enforce the security of chain reactions of cause and effect. We have to pull the rug out from under our own feet. And this is then what we do with the practice of the path that 
meditation and also post meditation. Then there's a question, what do you think about people suffering in the present poverty, abuse, sickness, etc., in terms of saying that to understand their present situation, they should know what they did in the past? I think it's a tricky point that can lead to uncompassionate views. This is exactly where it's very important that when we're studying karma, we're not talking punishment. We, know, we, we have to be careful not to bring into this discussion of, um, you could say, Christian views on moralism. No, if we run out of petrol, yeah, we can say it's we can punish ourselves, but it's not really that we've done anything bad. We just forgot petrol. So it's really just about understanding that cause has an effect. So it's very important that we have a compassionate view for people who have forgotten to put petrol in their tank or who have created the causes and conditions for uh, illness, poverty, etc. Because this, nobody, everybody is innocent, but on the basis of actions, then we find ourselves in different situations. This is not about us being moralistic or looking down. It's not as if some people are good because they have happiness and some people are bad because they have unhappiness. When we're looking at karma, we're not looking at some of these moralistic views. We're not imposing some absolute good and absolute bad. We're just looking at the mechanics of experience. So that's why it's important that we, that we extract ourselves from some of the sort of the heritage we have of moralistic, of the moralism basically. But it's a tricky one. Believe me, as someone who's been communicating about karma, I'm so familiar with this um, default reaction to the notion of cause has an effect or effect is based on a cause where we sometimes think oh it's just not you know that's why we sometimes would say oh the universe is not fair because it would sound terrible if we said the universe is fair because that would be saying they deserve that what we basically say in buddhism is that everybody is innocent on the basis of bewilderment we've gotten ourselves into a terrible situation this is the nature of samsara and we would say within samsara we cannot put a pinpoint anywhere where there isn't suffering. So it's about getting to the bottom of the condition altogether. Now, the karma of competitive mind is that it strives to achieve for oneself. So this is what we often have, the sense of, I'm going to get it right. I'm going to do better. So this is very much about self-centering. Enlightened karma is the awareness that sees situations beyond the self. We're doing more than just working for our own good, we're working beyond the self altogether. Vipassana, the wisdom that sees beyond karma, is about going beyond the patterns of self and beyond the bewilderment of self altogether. This is what we're going to be looking at in terms of um, understanding the, the, the development of ignorance and the development of the self. If you look in this chapter I put in the reading material that's called The Development of Ego, we can see there's a very good uh, explanation on the whole situation around self uh, by Trung Rinpoche. You can also look at Long Chimpa's more classical presentation, which is about how we got into samsara in the first place. As opposed to the ordinary competitive, self-centered competitive mind, then in, in both enlightened karma is beyond the self and also enlightened actions are spontaneous. What we call the enlightened activity, it doesn't come from an intention, I am going to help you. It's just this panoramic presence that is there organically for whatever is needed without somebody necessarily thinking, I am doing this for so-and-so. Trungpa Rinpoche says that is the basic idea of true karmic action in the highest sense. It automatically means the absence of speed. And that absence of speed automatically means that there is a sense of softness and a sense of warmth, which is compassion. You're not trying to achieve anything. If you have no ambition, no desire to achieve anything, you're just being there. Then that is an expression of compassion. It is the highest form of compassion. Now, ordinary religious compassion is deliberate. Real compassion is not about abiding by rules or doing the right thing. 
Real compassion is responding to the energy of the situation. Such religious ideas come with spiritual materialism. Taking refuge saves us from soft thinking or from this kind of, you could say, habitual, conventional way of thinking in terms of, you know, happiness is a result of having been a good boy and girl, like we were talking about before. Happiness is a reward. Suffering is a punishment. And that's where religious moralism, it's very much situated around this the basically what drives spiritual materialism is this terms of thinking of the self as absolute and turning the the spiritual project into uh, serving the self and that's not what we're doing in buddhism we're we're not particularly catering to the self at all and so we're abandoning the self serving and the sort of the you could say the cozy cocoon of pursuing the 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 um the reward for the self and avoiding the punishment of the self we're abandoning self altogether we're looking beyond that confused experience so i'm just gonna clean this up here so he says i'm just going to Okay, sorry. In the Buddhist tradition, we take refuge in the three jewels. So this is where we begin to engage the path and going beyond self. The Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. That is precisely the opposite of spiritual materialism. So taking refuge in the three jewels is not traditionally as we understand religion. Once you take refuge in the Buddha as an example, you do not worship any external deities. You're not seeking any extraordinary securities. You do not take refuge in your rich and powerful friends. You give up your security altogether. So the example of the Buddha is to go beyond the whole agenda of the self and the reference points that we might think would provide security. They might be deities. They might also be power. They might be lovers. They might be careers, status, and so on. We're no longer trying to uh, appropriate reference points for our security. That's what we're doing with the with the with the path. Now, there's some sometimes people are curious about collective karma. Conventionally, in our cultures and civilizations, we operate within duality. We think, oh, what is it that created the good times? What is it that created the bad times? And we have these kind of genealogies or histories and narratives about our cultures and civilizations karma is not really about going into that kind of um, genealogy or uh, speculation with knowledge of karma we're trying to relate simply to our immediate so we're not ultimately concerned about constructing some ideas of the dark ages or the kali yuga Trumbhambhaja, of course, as all Buddhists, talks about Kali Yuga, but he also speaks about it in a more immediate, momentary situation or situating it within particular Indian context, a particular Indian moment. And certainly he doesn't in, endorse some sort of absolute uh, idea of it. Of course, yes, Kali Yuga, which is a relative phenomenon, plays out in terms of various ways. But at the same time, we'd also want to understand karma and the understanding of these various periods in terms of relating to what is without particular kind of uh, reference, cultural reference points. So when we're talking about the relative working of the world, yes, we can of course say that particular actions of individuals created particular conditions. But it all comes down to individuals that did something. And yes, then some others might have continued their work. But we should understand really at the end of the day, we understand our cultural karma, collective karma, very much as like we said, this string of beads. But there's one action that feeds another action. Okay, let's just see. What does Trung Permission, oh, sorry. Um, I'm struggling to understand discipline. 
I always see your confused discipline with the taskmaster type approach. I don't think that's what um, Chomburamaj is saying. Please, could you tell me a way I could stop seeing it as a taskmaster type thing? Well, it's a bit like a no brainer. You know, we actually have discipline naturally. We brush our teeth. We do a lot of actions which we don't think about, but they are actions that actually contribute to our well being. We shower, that's discipline. We, we're polite with other people, that's discipline. We could, we could say, I don't feel like showering, I don't feel like brushing my teeth. And you know, it spirals inward and downward. So that's where we are all the time being proactive in terms of just engaging. But discipline comes with this notion of a no brainer. It's something that we don't debate. Shall I brush my teeth today? Should I shower? We just do it. And that's what is implicit in, in discipline. Of course, in our generation, discipline was kind of a, a bad word because it implied, you know, like Pink Floyd's The Wall, you know, the evil teachers, the sort of the, the taskmaster, sort of fear-driven approach to discipline. That's not at all what we mean here but it's about being constructive with our actions. What does Tumbramji mean by speed? Speed in the physical sense? Can you give an example, please? Well, no, more in a psychological sense. Of course, very often the two are interacted, you know? So, um, so physical speed, yes, can drive psychological speed, but particularly here, when we're talking about gaps, it's ceasing, beginning to actually be taking it, you know, we actually do it in a, in a, in a somatic sense when we, or psychosomatic um, sense, when we take a deep breath, huh? we're just about to launch into something. Somebody says, take a deep breath and we do that. And it actually provides psychological gap. We break the pattern of speed. So this is what we do on the practice of the path. We break our momentum and we begin to discover the gaps. So that's breaking speed. Okay, chapter two. And by the way, obviously we are going over time, but I think you're all aware of that. Like I say, these sessions, they will last from one hour to one and a half hour. So come, this chapter, karma, compassion and the dark age. Karma is basic to the workings of ego or ignorance. Karma has both samsaric and nirvanic aspects. Enlightened karma is free from action or conditionality. Samsaric karma is a condition of entrapment, but karma implies agency. We're not victims of random play or divine forces. So again, we've already covered both the fact that karma is innate to the working of our confusion, which is a condition of innocence but it is what has driven us into this condition of self-centering. This versus that, self versus other. Now, as far as karma goes, also what we looked at before, the enlightened karma is the freedom from being essentially driven by actions of the past. It's unconditional. It's just being organically there. Samsaric actions is different, but when we begin to see as yes, we're caught by particular conditions of entrapment, we can still see that the way it plays out is not something about something random. It's not somebody who's punishing us and it's also not just um, random. It's actually that we, we are, what we do has, has some impact. So when we say karma, it's not about it's your karma, man. It's about karma in the sense that we have agency. Again, this is where we don't subscribe to divine forces or the idea of randomness. We, what we do matters. We have agency. Trungpa says, whatever different types of karma we might have, we can channel it in different directions, provided we know how to do so. So we, we can choose our actions. Beyond that, it is possible to prevent karmic cause and effect altogether and to prevent that karmic flow. So that gives us enormous hope and freedom, seeing that we do not have to pay lip service to anybody, but we have to work with ourselves. So there's a lot of, with karma, there's a lot of sense of empowerment. This is also something that's lost in the often popular 
rendition of karma, that when we talk about karma, it actually provides some sense of, of empowerment. Yes, there's an understanding of how our actions construct the present, but there's also the notions that our present actions construct what comes next. Karma originates with the birth of delusion, the birth of ego. With ego, we have the volitional action of karma. With basic ignorance and the ensuing actions, we create the realms of samsara. These actions become patterns that construct our experience of reality. Now in here, we're beginning to talk about the various skandhas. This is where the initial first skandha, the skandha of form, it is where we begin to have a notion of self, where there's not just that we have a cognizant mind that is clear in the sense of cognizant, but it's also that this mind then begins to think I. And that's where we begin to have other. And that's where we begin to solidify and freeze mind into something it's not. It becomes ego. And the other is perceived as the object of ego. And that's the first skanda. On the basis of that, we then have the second skanda, feeling. I like, I don't like. On the basis of that, we have the third skanda, concept, which is good, bad. And on the basis of that, we have the fourth skanda, which is then when some things are good and bad, we begin to act in a particular way. We have impulses or we have volition. That's where we begin to act. And that's the fourth skanda, which has to do with karma. So that's where we begin to then have these patterns. And that is what drives our psychology and our perception of our world, our perception of ourself. And that's where we begin to construct these realities that we call the various realms of samsara. Mungram just says, the constant struggle of trying to maintain oneself, it's like the rotating potter's wheel trying to solidify our actions for the purpose of maintaining security is like throwing clay to the potter's wheel. When the pot is made, we have created our own coffin. We have created our own heaven or hell, whatever world we create. So we could say that this, um, this delusion of self is kind of like the, the potter's wheel, you know, something could happen and then once we are beginning to have stuff that we like and dislike that's like the clay that then begins to create whatever is our world whether it's heaven or hell and that's of course where in the buddhist context once we've established that we have no qualms in talking about heaven or hell whereas in a modern secular context it sounds incredibly uh, familiar to some of the dogmas that we have rejected. And that's where this discussion sometimes gets sort of a little bit of a, how do you say, it, we end up with some, some confused discussions where it has so much about losing, losing things in translation. But anyway, what we are understanding here is that on the basis of illusion or delusion of ego, we create various worlds. Our so-called memories, are shaped in the present based on our habits. This is like we said before. It's presently that we're having memories of, you know, who we are, what we want, and so forth. So karma is not that exotic, but it implies we can shape our future and we can cut its roots. So in terms of relative karma, we can shape our future, or absolute, we can cut the roots. That's what we're doing on the path, the relative and absolute. Right now, we have an opportunity we never have had in a billion years, which is the possibility of freedom. Now, in doing so, we are going to have to be a little bit imaginative, a little bit intuitive, a little bit awake. And that's where we need the guidance of the path. If we just rely on what we normally just abide by, then we're going to get, we're going to get, we're going to continue suffering. And that's why we talk about our habits and neurosis. So the neurosis is, is based on the self and on the basis then of the actions of the neurosis, we then have the habitual patterns. This is what we sometimes refer to as karma and kleshas. 
Now, when we begin to free ourselves, then we begin to have a glimpse of enlightened activity. If we begin to rise above our habits, our neurosis, we begin to have some sense of a little bit of wiggle room, enlightened activity. And so cutting the activity of the fifth skanda enables cutting the first skanda. When we are sitting down and meditating, we're not prone to our perceptions. We're not prone to our impulses. So actually, we could say the fourth and fifth skanda. We're also beginning to get down to the first skanda, the first skanda of form, the first skanda of delusion. Pung Brahmaja says, for all of us, there is a strong possibility that we can cut the root of karma. The fifth final stage of ego, the skanda of consciousness, and the first stage, the skanda of form of ignorance, meet together on this crucial, important point. The practice of meditation is the means of cutting the root of karma. And this is where it's so important that we are, um, that we are, first of all, practitioners. And also, if we are practitioners, that we all understand what am I exactly doing when I'm sitting down practicing, when I'm not giving in to the speed, the impulse, the patterning. And that's where we're beginning to cut the root of karma. Trumper says, in sitting and experiencing boredom, we are weakening the grip of the restless mind. We're cutting the circle of karmic consequences. We discover simplicity and openness with or without thoughts and intentions. Meditation is not magic. It's just the discovery of what is, discovery of a gap. Now, when we sit down and we meditate, we begin to not being fed in the way that we ordinarily are, are, ordinarily are. And so we're saying, well, you know, I'm being bored shouldn't be happening, I should not be bored, you know, like kids, you know, hey, we're bored, what entertainment, we're like that too. And that's where we want to be a little bit aware that there's some value in this, it's because actually the rest of this mind, the speedy mind that normally has a grip on us, we're actually defying it. And so we're cutting this circle of patterning, karmic consequences. Within this, yes, we might have thoughts, we might not have thoughts or whatever, but with all what is taking place is a greater experience of openness, simplicity. So we might have neurotic thoughts, we might have various kinds of intentions and so on, but it's beginning to look a little bit sort of open, more simple. So there's nothing magic taking place here, it's just that we're beginning to settle into a greater openness. Tom Pramaja says that simplicity itself brings a sense of openness. At that time, nothing is feeding you. You are giving and you are inviting more fresh air. At that moment, the constant collection of karmic seeds ceases. You're released from constantly sowing the seeds of karma when you don't have a project anymore. And because you don't have a project, therefore there's no ground. So this is where we are entering into a discovery of openness, of freedom. There's not that sort of lukewarm comfort zone where we proceed with our confusion and our speed. And we might for that reason feel there's no ground. But there's a place where we are not worried about not having any ground. And it begins to, this worry begins to be uh, how do you say, um, replaced by an appreciation of openness and the, 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 um, the value of openness. Now, when we're talking about rebirth, because that's something that, that, of course, we very often think of karma as something to do with rebirth. And that's true, um, but it, we shouldn't be narrow-minded about this. And that's, again, where rebirth it's not just about physical deaths, but it's also about what's happening every moment, really, just as karma is about every moment. So physical rebirth is similar to the deaths and rebirth of every moment. The level of neurosis dictates the kind of birth or rebirth we take. Rebirth is initiated by the fear of groundlessness. We then pursue what is not existent in a futile quest for security. So we could speculate a lot about, you know, past, present lives and all of that. But in fact, if we really want to know it, like this quote from the Tibetan tradition, it's more about what we're exactly doing right now. 
when we can understand what was in the past on the, on the basis of right now, and we can understand the future on the basis of right now. But we can also say, say that rebirth is something, and, and death and rebirth takes place all the time. We walk into a new situation. We leave an old situation behind, that's death. We walk into a new situation, that's a rebirth. Now, we might immediately panic and want to have some sort of security, some reference point. So we do that. We might be neurotic and that might shape very quickly how this new rebirth is. But we might also be open, less neurotic, and there's more wiggle room. The kind of karma we have might be more enlightened. So you could say we very often, in the case of neurotic rebirth, it's something where we're driven by this fear of groundlessness. And instead, we have this desire to have something we can refer to. So that's this futile quest of security. And in fact, what we're doing is just we're pursuing what is non-existent. You know, it's a bit like, um, and they're saying, you know, it's a bit like uh, it's a futile in the sense that we're building, we're building a house on what is, in fact, just ice. You know, it's going to melt. And that is the problem with samsara. It's not ultimately satisfactory. It is ultimately futile. Kung Paramaja says it's like camping on an ice block, which event eventually or fundamentally doesn't exist. You're camping on water, but still it seems solid to you. That's why seeming reality appearance is often called illusion or rainbow mirage. In the Buddhist teaching, these are metaphors for the illusory quality of phenomena. The mirage exists because of the non-existence. But the non-existence has a very seemingly solid ground. Thus, it is said that the truth of samsara should be realized as false, which is ultimate truth, but its falsity is true for us, relative truth. So these two, again, like Tsongsa Khandramaji often talks about in terms of understanding the nature of the Buddhist teaching, it's full of paradoxes. So what is reborn? When we say, hey, there's no self, then what is reborn? Well, it's the delusion. There is the discontinuity. There's individual moments. And yet again, because we're attributing continuity to what in fact is a discontinuity, then there's a perception of a chain of causes and conditions, of causes and results. And so these causes and conditions, they create the illusion of continuity, just like a a, a rosary or a mala looks as if it's a continuity, but it's made up of, you know, it's a discontinuity. And that discontinuity, um, or rather that, dis that what is ultimately a discontinuity, we attribute its solidity. And that's where what is really reborn is our illusion, our illusion of continuity. So that's what happens to us when we take rebirth after rebirth. We're continuing these patterns. Ending this delusion is not nothingness. We discover the purity of our existence. It's again like we take off these dark specks and all of a sudden we begin to see reality clearer. We're free. And that's also why we refer to this as pure realm. So in terms of enlightenment, we say, yes, we can refer to that on a relative level in terms of purity of our existence, a pure realm. Now, it's not as if we're going to go into some sort of ultimate, how do you say, um, ultimate uh, extracting ourselves from existence altogether. There's compassion. And so no longer being concerned with our, just ourselves, there's naturally an awareness of the world. And so out of compassion, we come back from this pure realm. Of course, pure realm, continues for the bodhisattva. Everything, everywhere is a pure realm. And yet there's engagement with the other that is not about retreating into some ultimate comfort zone. So this, of course, is something we need to experience. We can't really start to speculate about it. We need to experience this. Pumparamita says, Tushita heaven or the pure land could be created whenever and wherever you're capable of doing that. It's not particularly regarded as being upstairs in heaven. It's everywhere. When you are born in the pure land, then wherever you go, whatever you do, you are in the pure land. 
that is happening here on this earth now. So pure land is not something that we find somewhere else. It's what happens when we remove our delusion. Now, somebody was asking from Paramja, how come we can't remember our past lives? And he says, we forget our, or we, implicit in his answer is that we forget our past lives just like we forget other past events, for example, our childhood. So we're forgetful because we're so fixated and serious about our existence. You know, we're so tunnel vision on this, we're so serious about what we're experiencing right now that everything else is sort of bleeped out. So, more important is the present. Anything else might be a myth. So in terms of us being worried about our situation, if we could just settle into this freedom in the present, then we're beginning to touch reality. And this is not about being seriously fixated on the present, but this is about discovering this freedom. And in fact, everything else could be just mythology, right? It's not there yet, and it's really just a memory. So within this relative world, we want to align ourselves with good karma. So of course, within our thinking about past lives, future lives, and so on, again, the message is we want to make sure that we have good karma. But again, ultimately, we want to understand that both good and bad karma, they reinforce this delusion. Kumbhra just says, learning to behave better in a more genteel way is working with good karma. And bad karma is completely treacherous and savage and really becoming monstrous. But somehow both of those are conditional things. Fundamentally speaking, both good and bad karma are further reinforcements of samsara. They're all based on this self-centering. So even the most subtle reference point of keeping a virtue keeps duality in place, meaning we might be pursuing very dutifully virtue, but it's still driven by this sense of I and my object, fearful, the fear of space, the attempt to secure. And so that's where even though we might have happiness, we are still perpetuating duality. Virtue can, can be driven by purpose, or it can be just simply being without purpose. So we can have the two kinds of virtue. One is the one where we are sort of dutifully trying to create conditions for happiness. And the other one is coming from a place of wisdom, where we're just being. We don't really have a purpose. And as an expression of that, you could say an expression of our elegance, then naturally we are virtuous. So this is where we need to be free of the Christian or Abrahamic notions of good versus evil, which of course many of us grow up with that, punishment and reward, absolute good, absolute evil, don't really exist. They're just discontinuous experiences. And particularly, if we have virtue and we then turn it into righteousness, righteousness about, about our virtue can never be good karma. That just is where the rigidity of this duality goes into overdrive and we have righteousness that ultimately then could become aggressive. aggressive. I am right, you're wrong. So this is where we look at the example of the Buddha, the Buddha's non-aggression, the simplicity of the Buddha. And this is about natural virtue without any particular purpose, without any particular dogmatic sense of rules and regulations. So that's where the Buddha is seen as someone. We could see the Buddha and some traditions do see the Buddha as somebody who was working their way through something. But also, particularly in the Mahayana, we really just see the Buddha as an expression of compassion. And we don't really see the Buddha as someone who was working in terms of karmic traces. This is a little bit of, you could say, a um, the point of debate between some Buddhist traditions. Now, as far as we're concerned, both in terms of looking at the Buddha and understanding his example, we can also appreciate the students of the Buddha who provide a good example. We have this story of Ananda, you know, when the Buddha had passed away, then we have what's called the first council, when the Buddha's students gathered and they wanted 
qualified students. So they would only, they, in the first council, you really only included those who actually had spiritual realization, who were ahas. Now, Ananda, despite having been the, Ananda, the attendant of the Buddha for decades, he was not included because he didn't have that spiritual realization. So Ananda, for us, is a good example of an imperfect practitioner who then humbly went to some of his own students who he had passed on teachings of the Buddha to, and he requested uh, teachings from them. And on the basis of that, he attained Ahatship. He attained realization, and he was then included in the circle of those who, who gathered the Buddha's teaching. But that's where Ananda then went and asked um, teachings from some of his own students or from some of the Buddha's younger students. So that's a very good example for all of us. When we talk about nirvana, okay, this is a little bit sort of, a, might be a bit dense here on the last moments of the webinar. <laughs> but when we say nirvana, we're, we're just saying freedom from suffering. That's true. It's basically returning to a natural condition. Now, if we're sick, when we return to not being sick anymore, we don't really think of ourselves as defined by not suffering. And so we're just back into being normal, right? So we would say non-sickness is not an absolute. Nirvana is not an absolute. And so it's not something that ultimately is achieved with intention. Of course, we would say, yes, we aspire to enlightenment. We have intention. But the ultimate vipassana is something which is where we discover the freedom from any dualistic construct, such as getting from here to there. So ultimately, while we on the relative level aspire to proceed on the levels of the path, the ultimate breakthrough is a place that has no intention. And that unconditional instinct or nature, this is what we always have been. Just like if we might be sick with a, with a curable condition, and that's when we return to our natural condition again, it's what we always were. Now this ground is what we sometimes call Buddha nature, we sometimes call it primordial ground. And that is something that's not owned by confusion. It's not held by ordinary, um, ordinary mind or some sense of ambition or survival. This is the vipassana or the wisdom that lies beyond the ordinary mind. Now that mind is not, as some people think, sort of some sort of like vacuous, empty condition. It's not a nothing. On the contrary, again, it's like where we take off our shades and we see clearly, and this is more a state of being free from uh, any kind of struggle. It's a celebration. There's some questions. If what is really reborn is our delusion or our misapprehension of continuity, does going beyond rebirth mean simply only dwelling in the gap? Well, it's not only dwelling in the gap, but it's allowing for openness. What has driven our thirst for rebirth is this neurosis that fails actually to appreciate our reality. So in in the proposition here, we're talking about a greater reality. Um, we can't really refer to it as dwelling anywhere, but discovering openness is discovering something that's free from the confinement. So you could say no longer being confined, we could say it's dwelling in the big gap, but we usually just refer to it as freedom, you know? So in that sense, the gap is indicative of what, what lies beyond freedom. Yeah. So the last slide then is a, quoting the last few lines from chapter two, which Fung Burmaji says, so the understanding of karma here is very broad, very open. It gives us a sense that everything is up to us. That's the basic sense of understanding karma, that everything is up to us and we have to work on ourselves. Maybe you get some help from others, but even so, you have to work on yourself. From this point of view, the attainment of enlightenment 
is transcending neurotic habitual patterns. And in order to transcend habitual patterns, one has to cut through the root of karma, which is ego's sense of security. The birth of ego is where the original basic question of karma arises. So that's the end of uh, today's study. Uh, next time, please read chapters three and four. So thank you for hanging in there. This is important material. And yet it's so important that we're clear on this. It's not that complicated really. And so um, I hope between reading this, the book, and then also this uh, presentation based on the PowerPoint, I hope this results in something that's helpful. Okay. By this positive action, may all beings perfect the accumulation of merit and wisdom and attain the two supreme kayas which arise from merit and wisdom.